Okay, let's talk about spl um, splitting the brain. So it's, I find this a topic, as most people do, of fascinating, of great fascination, that essentially what you can do, you can split the brain, as far as we can tell, there are two conscious minds inside one conscious skull, which is pretty neat. Which also leads you to ask the question, to what extent you can find two or more conscious mind even in a normal, in a normal brain, that's not split brain. And this is also interesting, particularly at Caltech, since historically lots of research was done at Caltech, including research of, uh, by Roger Sperry here, who was a professor in biology, who got the Nobel Prize for the split brain work uh, in 1981. So, as I pointed out the first time I, show, I brought in this brain, and as any sort of glance at any anatomy can show you, the brain is symmetrical. Now, some functional imaging doesn't always show that, because it, depending on the cut of the plane through the brain, sometimes, you know, if the plane isn't, if the plane isn't exactly even, you can get uneven cut. But, but by, and, and there, of course, are symmetry in the, in the brain, in the sense that one brain hemisphere isn't exactly, may not exactly have the same size, or might, some of the gyri might have different location. I know David Heger, a well-known vision researcher, the location of his V1 in the left and right hemisphere are, um, are quite different, but all in all, the, if, um, the, the brain is symmetric, there are two corticals, two cortic uh, cortical hemispheres, there are two thalami, there are two basal ganglia, there are two retinas, there are two cochleas, in fact, there are two sensors, right, there are two nostrils, there's two of everything, except a few midline structures, um, which are interesting represented if you think about the tongue or if you think about the tail that a monkey might have or about other midline structures, they're usually represented bilaterally. Uh, so, so, for example, for the tongue, I think there's representation both in the left and the right hemisphere. Um, now, there, there are a few exceptions. The, the best known, uh, known ones are these two glands, the pineal gland, the pituitary gland. They're, they're sort of a list of minor other exceptions where you only have a single structure. Uh, so, the pineal gland is of interest in, it's sometimes also called the third eye, because in some simpler invertebrates, I, th invertebrates, I think including in, uh, in amphibians and reptiles, it does have direct photopigment in it. And so, in, so, also, I think in snakes, they can directly, this is used to regulate, in some lower mammals, it's used to regulate the circadian rhythm. Now, that's probably also important in us. It do, in us, uh, or certainly in primates, it doesn't get a direct retinal input, probably because it's too well hidden inside the brain. So, as I said, in some animals, like reptiles, they are, they, 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 some light can, can shine through the skull and directly in, the, in their cells inside the pineal gland that are photosensitive. In us, it doesn't work that way. We have the small input from the eye into the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It sits above the crossing of the optic nerve, which is called suprachiasmatic. It sits above the, um, the, the, that crossing. And it gets uh, input from the retina. It's responsible for circadian rhythm. And it, in turn, projects into the pineal gland. Historically, this is very interesting because this is the one that... Um, that uh, René Descartes implied as being the seat of the soul, partly because it was a mainline structure, and he thought, he was very observant, he thought, well, clearly, we experience ourselves as unitary, as whole, so therefore, you know, whatever it is, it can't be in one of the brain hemispheres, it can't be in one of the individual hemispheres, it's got to be in, in a structure like this. He was just wrong. Uh, at the time, also, thought, people thought you would die when you, had, when, when you lose a pineal gland, that's not true. The other one, which is somewhat big, I mean, these are both tiny structures, this is like a, like a, um, uh, like a tiny lentil, and this is even smaller. This one is responsible for doing, you know, endocrine system, growth hormones, lactation, sex hormones, all of those things that are, are controlled directly, indirectly by the pituitary gland. So with the exception of these uh, minor structures, everything is, uh, is symmetrical. Now, um, the brain is connected, the cortical hemisphere are connected by a number of uh, pathways. The most, the biggest one, the one that everybody knows about, is called the corpus callosum. It has, let me see. So here you see this is the corpus callosum. This is the back part of the corpus callosum. And this is a, a side view, so you can see the corpus callosum. So uh, before the previous view was a, was a cut across here. So this is called the genou, the, the, the knee. So these are roughly 200 million fibers, a very large fiber bundle, 200 million fibers that connect the left and the right brain half. So you can see that, for example, there are already connections that go back all the way back to primary visual cortex, um, although they're, they're minor. And as you go to higher and higher areas, you can, if you have a cell, let's say you have a monkey fixating, and usually the representation, of course, because everything is crossed, the, let's see, the, the right hemisphere looks at the left, uh, um, the left world, but in higher areas, you can also modulate the firing of the cell by showing input to the other side of the, um, of the visual field. And those inputs are mediated by this corpus callosum.
They're mainly, they're very small fibers. They have to be because it's not that big and there are 200 million of them. They're sort of be below, you know, uh, most of them below micrometer and diameter. Most of them are myelinated. Most of them originate from layer two or layer three pyramidal neurons. Now, there are also some other minor connections. There's this anterior commissure here, which is quite important to connect the left and the right olfactory brain. And also the high level, um, infra high level vi visual brain is connected through here. And then there's something else called the posterior commissure. Commissure is just a surgical term for any pathway that connects to the, the, the two, um, any white matter pathway that connects the two brain areas. And then there's various connections down here in the brains, in the midbrain, here at the level of the colliculi, colliculi and then there are sort of connections um, uh, at, the midbrain, at the brainstem level. Yeah, but this one is the biggest one. Now, Okay, this just shows them again. So the, this is the, the as, you know, this is the white matter, this is the gray matter, the proverbial gray matter, which, which you think. So the white matter is white because of the fatty insulation, the myelin, the one that helps to speed up action potential propagation. And so you can see here you have these, um, you have this massive pathway and this much smaller pathway, the anterior commissure. Now sometimes, even today, I was recently talking to a neurosurgeon, even today this operation is still occasionally performed, although much less, because fortunately um, other interventions are, are uh, effective. It's quite a radical, it's quite a radical uh, procedure. You cut, into, essentially, the, most of the corpus callosum. So sometimes what happens, these patients, they cut, they cut some fraction of it, so for example, they end up cutting this, and then the patient will recover, and then they, and then they'll, they, they want to assess how bad the epileptic seizures are. And then sometimes they cut the second part, including the anterior commissure. And that turns out to make a big difference. If you just cut most of this, you see remarkable little deficits. I'll talk about that. To really get the dramatic deficits that most people know about, you have to cut all of this, including this anterior commissure. Now, why do you do this drastical surgery? Well, you do it because you have, these are people who have uh, bad cases of grand mal epileptic seizures, you know, the classical one where you go into in a clonus, tonus, these um, uh, attacks. And usually they originate in a single hemisphere, they originate in a small part of one hemisphere, very often in and around the hippocampus and temporal lobe. And then they spread through um, intracortical um, fibers as well as co um, callosal fibers throughout the one hemisphere and then into the other one. And then they become so-called generalized attack and then uh, people become unconscious. As I mentioned before, if sometimes if an attack is, is, as you may, is saw in one of the movies, if the attack is localized, in fact, the patient may hardly notice. And for example, if the patient is asleep, she might not even wake up. So it's a, it's a, radical, it's a radical cure for, for very bad cases uh, of epileptic seizures. Um, now, what, okay, so there are several remarkable observations. One is that this operation was first performed in the, in the early to mid-1940s. I think it was pioneered in the U U.S. What's remarkable about it, that once a patient recovers, now this is a major operation where you cut and you, um, you know, it's quite a lot of ble bleeding. And of course, at the time, they had to do the, they had to do the open um, skull surgery. So it's a, it's a very bloody operation. It's a, it's a major operation. So people took a while to recover. But once they recovered, if you read the report from the surgeon, it's remarkable all these sort of reports um, were sort of in unison that by and large there was no deficits. Now the surgeons themselves, or the neurosurgeons themselves realized that this is, that this is very strange, that it boggles the mind, that this massive structure in the brain, you know, that, 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 that has to have some function. You cut it and there's no apparent function. I mean, they were aware of this paradox. They were not dumb. But they, they failed to see any major parad they failed to see any major deficit that people recovered and once they recovered, the routine medical examination didn't show any difference. And certainly in a social situation, in a social situation you would notice. Now you have to normalize for the fact that by the time they have this operation, these are not normal healthy people, right? They don't take a normal healthy brain and cut it. These are people who have severe epileptic seizures. So very often what happens, one hemisphere may, be, it may already be significant damage. So they may have already, for example, difficulty, you know, depending which hemisphere it is, with walking, or they might have some speech impediment, etc. So these are not healthy, normal people to start with. But once you normalize, uh, um, and for that fact, there's very little difference before and after, except that afterwards the patient had, had a, a significantly reduced incident of seizures. So the, so the moral is here, the brain is very complex and it's, it uses all sorts of cues to adapt. And unless you really know what you're looking for, you may totally miss it, which I think is an important lesson for, for particularly if you want to look at very subtle behavior like, like, like attention and consciousness. Now, the, 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 what we call today the split brain syndrome, 
was not realized until what happened here. So Roger Sperry here at Caltech, who really, well, he got his Nobel Prize for two different things. One is developmental, and the other one is split brain. And he had a, a large research program that started in the 40s and 50s, which involved split brain in, in animals, where they did these procedures. Um, we could, of course, do it much more routinely, much more you know, repetitively um, in, in animals, in frogs, and in cats, and in monkeys. And they observed, a certain t they observed some, some interesting syndromes that I'll talk about, not nearly as dramatic as later on what you see in humans, but you get some disconnection syndromes. And so, based on that, they, they, then he got together with an enterprising surgeon, a neurosurgeon here at, at, um, called in, in the LA area called Joe Bogan. Some of you might have... Have any of you taken his class? Okay, so, so um, it was really Joe, Joe, Joe Bogan and, and Roger Sperry got together and realized, well, hey, here we have these human patients, and based on the animal literature, we really expect some, defic some specific deficits. And then they, they, they got around testing it, and then they, f they saw and they discovered what we know today as split brain experiments, a split brain uh, syndrome. So like I say, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for that. Um, so, I mean, what are some ways of testing these patients? Well, so one way to test them, so for example, if you ask, first of all, you assess for language. You say, well, I mean, can these people talk? And they talk normally. Again, normalized for uh, the, the amount of talking they could do before. You show them something like this, you ask them what it is, and they, say, they tell you it's a key. Now, the simple way you can, how you can elicit the deficit, if you put the, um, the key into my left hand, I say it's a key. If you put the key, uh, um, if I now, you know, if this all takes place hidden under, let's say, a table, and you put an object into my left hand, I will be unable to say what it is. So a simple test as this will, will show you dramatic deficit. I, you know, you put the key in my hand so I can see it. The patient will say it's a key. You put the key in the, um, into his hand so he doesn't see it, and he has no idea what it is. He'll, he'll, he'll stumble and say it's a, it's a, it's a, watch, it's a watch, it's a, it's one of these things. And you know, he'll try desperately. You know, his brain will so desperately, you know, try to get any cues, and you know, he might focus him here, and then he, then he might guess it's a, it's a key. So what happens? It's, as you all know, there's, uh, this, uh, we talked about it in vision, there's this uh, causing, um, with the exception of olfactory input, everything else is caused, the motor input is also caused. So the, the, input, the tactile input from the left hand is made accessible to the right, cortic, uh, right somatosensory cortex. You disconnected now the right somatosensory cortex from its left hemisphere. It turns out that the left hemisphere in most people, not in everybody, most people is the one that's language competent. The right one is mute to a certain extent. So the left one, the talking one, the one, so you always have to realize now that there are two people inside these, two conscious minds inside this one head. And if you're talking to a patient, you might talk because his ears are intact, you talk to both hemispheres. But if you listen to the patient, you know, if you listen to the patient, you listen to his, uh, left, to his left half. So his left hand does not have access to, if, you, if he looks at it, he can see it. If you don't, if you prevent uh, seeing the left hand, the left brain will not know what it is, and, and you know, it just won't know what it is. You put it in the right hand, you know, he'll immediately say it's a key. So you can, so actually using a very, very trivial test, uh, you could have, you know, this could have been elicited from, from, from the get-go if you knew what you were looking for. Um, so there's this thing called hemispheric lateralization, which has gotten a lot of press over-exaggerated, of course, over overblown in the popular literature, you know, it's all this holistic, what is it, it's the, the analytical, rational mind in the left and the holistic thinking uh, in the right or something like that. Now, like many of these naive ideas, they're based on, on a germ of truth. So, what is it? So, people talk, and surgeons have always talked since a long time about the minor and the major hemisphere, the dominant or the non-dominant hemisphere. Now, for most of us, um, uh, for most of us, the dominant hemisphere is, is the left. Who's the left-hander here? Is there anybody who's the left-hander? Okay, so there's three of you, there's a chance that one of you will have, there's some chance that one of you will have your dominant hemisphere on the right. So in, in, um, in almost all right-handers, so most of us are right-handers, um, although the incident of left-handers is higher, it correlates to a certain extent with IQ, uh, it correlates with um, uh, social um, maladaptive behavior, so very intelligent people or criminal people or other people tend to be more often left-handed. It's, it's rather interesting. It correlates with um, immune dif uh, difficulty with the immune system, um, co uh, correlates with mathematical ability, correlates with maleness, all sorts of interesting things. And yeah, but, 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 but all in all, I mean, almost all of us right-handers will have the left dominant hemisphere. 
So even three quarters of left handers will have a left dominant hemisphere. So if there are four of you left handers, one of you will statistically have a right dominant hemisphere, but almost everybody will have a left dominant hemisphere. So uh, how do you test this? There's subtle tests and there are more direct tests. The more direct test is you inject an barbiturate here into the carotis interna, something like a sodium amethyl. Now, of course, you, do, you don't want to do that in normal people. You know, like you're injecting something, there's always a chance of um, infection of embolism or something. Uh, but if you do that, then um, for a couple of minutes, um, what, what you'll see, the, you'll silence one or the other hemisphere, and um, you will, uh, so if you silence the dominant one, then Literally, you've silenced the person. Although, it's not true that the right cannot speak at all. It can understand if you speak very slowly in single words. It can, or if you print out, you know, if you have big characters on single words, it can understand, some of these patients can understand, the right, the right hemisphere, some patient can understand some language and can speak some little language. Certainly, it can answer if you ask a simple question of the like yes and no. Uh, but it's, it's certainly not very fluid. And then if you inject it in the non-dominant hemisphere, so let's say if you inject it in the right one, so the amethyl, then you will hardly notice a difference. If you inject it into the, into the left one, then I will be silenced. And then you, can, then you can now test what the remaining hemisphere you can do. The other way to do it is you can do it in normal. You put images, you know, you lateralize the input. You put images either into the left or the right hemisphere, and then you can sometimes see reaction time differences between the left and right. So, for example, the right is slightly more um, visual competent. The, sli the right one is slightly more bad at handling sensory communication. And the reaction times tend to be somewhat faster uh, if you put things in the right hemisphere and then in the, in the left hemisphere. Dominance begins prior to speech onset, so it's probably something that's coded very, very early on, uh, probably, you know, in, in utero, I suspect. Um, so, let me see. Yeah, so, so there's a huge literature, much of which I don't find all that interesting. There's a huge literature on brain specialization. So, um, and what, what can and what cannot be communicated across the, across the corpus callosum. So one thing you have to remember that a lot of these lateralization, the fact that things are lateralized, that means the fact that, let's say, you find language much more on the left and certain visual aspects much more on the right hemisphere, is most pronounced in us, in humans. It's much less pronounced in other animals, much, much less pronounced. You find it in some, uh, for example, some, some parrots, you know, that can sort of imitate speech, and some other species have some degree of lateralization, but it's, it's, like, it's not nearly as dramatic in us. And in us, it's more, um, if you remove language, so it's really, I mean, lateralization is mainly about language, because if you t once you take language out of the equation, the remaining degree of lateralization is much more subtle. As I mentioned, there's some degree of visual competence, there's increased visual competence in the right and in the left hemisphere, but it's a minor one. Um, it's really the, uh, in the language one. So now, of course, language one, was, this was known already from before, from, from um, going back to Broca himself, who was a neurologist in uh, Paris at the uh, Charcuterie in, 90, in, um, in um, when was it, 18... 1850, 1860, and in fact, the, 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 the part of the brain called Broca's area we call after him because he realized this first in a patient, or he wrote about it first in a patient that had, um, had a so-called aphasia, an inability to speak, except very explosively swear words, um, uh, that he had a very large tumor, I believe, in the left part of the prefrontal cortex, area 45, 46, here. So this is called uh, um, Broca's area. Now again, with many of these functional areas, one has to be a little bit careful. This is not sort of, it's not always exactly at the same location. It's plastic. If you lose this, depending on your age, certainly if you lose it before, if you're, you know, if you lose it, if you're very young before the onset of puberty, you might be able to recover language within a few months. Um, and then sometimes it shifts to the other hemisphere. Sometimes it can shift, it can shift around here. Fact is, if you have a lesion, or if you take away large parts of sort of in and around Broca's area, you'll have difficulty with, with generating speech. Okay, but it's, so, so it's not that this is just one single area, and once you take that out, you're totally incompetent at speaking. It's, uh, it's, it's localized in most people roughly in a, in a broad area around here. Now, this is the, the, the different types of aphasic, the different types of, of speech impediments. <coughs> Some are called after another, I think in Austrian, Wernicke, probably in Vienna, uh, sorry, Wernicke's area. This is in the posterior parietal cortex. And this is, main, this is close to audit, this is mainly perceptive speech, so this is understanding speech. 
Right, so this is speak, uh, the act of speaking itself, which of course partly is a motor output, right, because you have to c control your larynx. Partly it's, um, you have to generate the grammar and everything. And here this is, of course, here this is uh, the, the perceptive part of speech, uh, the receptive part of speech, understanding speech. And then you can also what have what's called a, a conduction aphasia, where you have the fibers, there's a fiber, big fiber bundle that goes from here to here. If that fiber bundle, this one here, of course, if that fiber bundle is interrupted, then you might be able to understand, but you can, and you might be able to speak, but there's no direct connection between the two anymore. So in other words, you have a great difficulty of time for, you know, if, if somebody asks me, you know, if you talk to me and ask me to, you know, uh, say who I am, then I might not be able to do that, although I can perfectly well understand it, and in principle I am able to say so, but I'm missing the direct connection between these two hemispheres. So this is all in the left. Now remember there was one other asymmetry we talked about in neglect. So in neglect, this, this weird thing that folks in visual, more properly called in visual or hemi, uh, visual spatial hemi neglect, typically the patient will have a stroke in his right hemisphere, and his left field of view he will neglect. So it's not like it's, well, it's not black, right? Remember I said if I lose my right primary visual cortex, the area will just be black. It'll be like this and I know it's gone. In neglect, it's more subtle. It's not, it's not black. It's just not there at all anymore. And so this is where people run into things and, you know, they just, you know, they only eat half of the plate, etc. and they won't compensate. If you have a V1 lesion that you'll compensate, move your head over to look with the other part of your brain. With the neglect, you don't do that. Now, almost all, again, the predominance of neglect patients have a neglect following a right parietal stroke, so there is another asymmetry there. And it might, in fact, be the other side of the coin that you have this representation here on the other side in the right parietal, because on the left parietal you have this, uh, you have this speech area. So again, once again, most of these specializations might, might end up in humans are so dominant compared to animals because they end up, they end up relating directly or possibly indirectly to, uh, to speech. I think, I think, so I think if I remember we mentioned this, there's um, Nancy Cambridge at MIT and she's um, discovered this area, characterized this area using functional brain imaging called the fusiform face area. And you can do that, there's various ways, the standard way you show a person, a normal subject faces in the magnet, and then you show the same faces but they're all scrambled. But you have the same low level cues, or for example you can take faces versus images of statues or, uh, sorry, images of, um, of uh, places, of hills and houses and stuff. And you can see where's the bigger activity. And you get in each case an area in part of the, in the fusiform gyrus called the fusiform face area. And I think if I remember that's present in all people on the right, the right hemisphere, but it's not present, it's not always present on the left. Is that correct? Something like that. I think so, yeah. Have you ever found a difference in MT or some of these other visual areas? And the size or the, the strength of the effect, yeah, it's, it's about the same in the, yeah, so that's my supposition. That for, for the most part, certainly all the, uh, all the early areas, it's, it's uh, very difficult to see any difference. And if there are differences, they tend to be more of a subtle nature in, in vision compared to speech. So like I said, take all these right, right, in fact, there are all these books, right, left side, right side books. I mean, most of them, I think, are pretty well baloney. So what are the consequences if you, we care about consciousness? Well, one thing is, um, so what this research shows, it's difficult to communicate specific sensory information, let's say, about the fact that there's a red, you know, a red flower there or there's a dog over there. It's very difficult to commute that sort of information from the left brain to the right brain without the corpus callosum. That's really why you have the corpus callosum. Think of it like a big bus, you know, 200 million uh, broad uh, bus that communicates information from, uh, um, between the two cortical hemispheres. Now, there are some exception things like eye attentional control and eye movement. In fact, there's some nice experiment by Mike Zaniger where he shows that, remember, the visual search paradigm where I have different letters and I'm asking you, is there a green letter present? Is there a T among L's? You know, you have to look. This is called visual search. There's some evidence that split brain patients can do it twice as fast as normal can. And the idea is they can sort of have two searchlights independently and they can now search with two searchlights rather than with one searchlight. Uh, and eye moves, you can also see, it also appears to be that eye movements you can control either with the left, uh, with the right or the left brain independently. Um, that's partly the case because these things are partly done by the colliculus, and the colliculi are never cut. You could just call, cut the corpus callosum, you don't cut the low level connections. Now, of course, this should give rise to 
you should all think about this. I mean, should worry, you should ask me a question. How can, if this is the case, how can, who establishes dominance in the brain? Who establishes dominance in the brain? If you have both cortical, both brains who can control something and they're usually not connected because now they're missing these two million fibers, then you can, in principle, get some type of behaviors like here where they fight or where you get that um, the right hemisphere in, um, initiates one behavior and the left hemisphere in, um, initiates the opposite behavior. I saw this one movie I tried very hard to get, but it's, the doctor didn't release it to me. It's a, a patient, this was in Dakota, in north, uh, either in north or south Dakota, where this was a patient who just recently had a split brain operation. Now, fortunately, these uh, syndromes, what I'm telling you now, goes away uh, within a couple of weeks. So here you had the, the case that the doctor asked the, the woman uh, how much seizure she, has she had since the operation. And she said three, but her left hand did this, one. So the, the left hand pointed one, but she said three. And then the doctor pointed it out to her, and then she looked at this, and then she tried to do this, and then she fought with herself. And it looked uh, sort of a cross between slapstick, you know, between, um, uh, you know, yeah, slapstick, I mean, comedy and tragedy. You realize that because suddenly she, was, she bursted out in, in, flame, in, 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 um, in tears. And, you know, the doctor what, asked her what the matter was. She said, well, my, my hand always does that to me. So my, my hand does that to me. Sort of like, this is, a, this is not my hand, and my hand does that to me. So what you see there, when she says, to me, that's her left dominant hemisphere, and it's the left hand, which is the right hemisphere. It's an independent person now to a certain extent, and then they have these fights. So classically, you know, when one hand will sort of, you know, open the shirt, and the other one will close the shirt, or things, or things of that ilk. Now, usually, for, uh, fortunately for the patient, these, um, this sort of behavior goes away because very quickly, the, usually the left hemisphere established dominance. So, I mean, same thing with limbs, right? Because you could imagine, you know, if my left hand, you know, my, my left cortex says, well, you know, I'm supposed to move to the right, and my, my other one says to the left, you know, I'm, I'm going to be a heap of bones without going anywhere. So fortunately, that doesn't happen. That's why, when, as I mentioned, when you meet these patients in a social context or you see movies of them, they look relatively normal and they can do, you know, normal behavior, etc. Why? Well, because there is some, you know, some reorganization, fortunately, in these patients. And so the one hemisphere can, and usually it's a dominant one, can establish total dominance over the other one so you don't have these fights. Now, that does not mean that there couldn't be silent sort of storms ranging in the, you know, when these people think, I find it an utter source of a source of fascinating sort of uh, in, uh, you know if you think about it, uh, issues like personal memories. You know, he, you know, here you are, a, 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 you know, a person you have a normal life, and then your brain is cut. So what about, you know, where are your where are your memories? <clears throat> Where's your notion of selfhood? Um, now it's very difficult to judge this with normal patients, with these patients, because as I said, very, they, these of course are patients, so it means by the very nature their brain isn't a normal one. So a lot of one brain might not be operational before the op before the operation even. Uh, so some of these questions maybe we can only answer once we have a um, a benign way of rapidly turning off corpus callosum. I mean that would be a cool tool, right? If you can take a normal brain and just you know you you quickly take a drug or you apply some sort of magnetic field and it sort of disrupts for, let's say, the next half hour, the connection between my left and the uh, right hemisphere. Um, because then you can really ask these questions, you know, about personal identity and things like that. The other, uh, so that's that. Um, yes, so here they, they've done sort of this, they've done sort of, you can see these anecdotes where they tell the left hemisphere a joke and the right one blushes but doesn't, doesn't know what. Or, the, or um, sorry, the, the, the left hemisphere, you know, so, you know, if he has a joke, laughs, the right one sort of, all, uh, you know, the right face also mimics that laughing, but has no idea why. Or you show something, a so, some socially embarrassing scene to the left hemisphere, and then the, the right hemisphere will sort of, will, um, sorry, you show it to the right hemisphere, and the left one will have a feeling that something awkward occurred, and that sort of the person is blushing, but without knowing why, and then tries to confabulate. You know, just try to reason, you know, why am I blushing now? Uh, so the idea is that you can sort of mediate um, more diffuse type of information. It's probably mediated through, uh, through brainstem, but all specific sensory information, with some exception, really require the corpus callosum. The bottom line is really this, that yes, the, le the left one is linguistic, much more competent. The right one is not totally mute, but much less competent. But as far as we can tell, the, ri the right one can ask and answer question, meaningful question. It has working memory. It has 
you can interact with it in a more limited way because you cannot, you know, it's not as fluent, but you can certainly act with, interact with it. So as far as people can tell, both hemispheres appear to be conscious. This is from, from Roger Sperry's. Although some authorities have been reluctant to credit the disconnected minor hemisphere, the, the, the right one, even with being conscious, it is our own interpretation based on a large number and variety of non-verbal tests that the minor hemisphere is indeed a conscious system in its own right. Perceiving, thinking, remembering, reasoning, willing and emoting. All at a characteristic human level that both the left and the right hemisphere may be conscious, simultaneously in different, even mutually conflicting mental experiences that run along in parallel. I think there's a great American novel waiting to be written here. There's an interesting novel, sort of a philosophical novel, written. Um, it's a... Um, it's, um, um, I think it starts off as a crime story and then a jury, a jury trial. It's written by a philosopher, Canetti, and it's based on, a, on an interesting neurological possibility. There's a weird syndrome called Machiavella, something other. It's a double name of two Italian doctors. A syndrome which is also known as the Italian red wine syndrome. So it's a rare poisoning due to some ingredient in some type of um, Italian red wine. That can, that can selectively destroy the corpus callosum. And so in this fictitious account, this uh, person has this um, a neurological deficit and he turns out that he, he's happily, well, it looks like he's happily married to his wife, but then he murders her most brutally. And then there's a, um, a jury trial. And it turned out, in this, in this is all a fictitious account, it turns out that it's the left hemisphere, it's the, um, the, non-dominant right hemisphere which plotted to kill the wife and, and, and did so, not the left one. And so now, of course, the jury is sort of, uh, you know, they call them expert witnesses and, you know, do you, you know, is this guy guilty of homicide or not? You know, because, you know who's guilty? Because they're now two, hem you know, either the left or the right hemisphere is guilty. And I think the, the jury says, uh, um, doesn't convict, but then his left hemisphere is so and, and then sort of his, his left hemisphere is so upset at this because he says the right hemisphere is laughing at me for getting away with murder of my wife. That the left hemisphere, his, his right hand takes a gun from the policeman and shoots his, his right cortex. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting story. Anyhow, I, I think there is, there is some true uh, interesting story to be written here about these silent storms that might rage across... Um, uh, across the remaining connections in these, uh, in these in the individuals. Operation, it seems to me that very quickly one, for most things, one hemisphere established dominance. So the, uh, the lesson for us is that whatever the neural collective conscience is, it can be replicated in the true hemisphere. So if it's true that the, the non-dominant hemisphere can also be conscious, can feel and sense, and that's what the evidence seems to suggest, then whatever the mechanism is, it has to be split. There has to be something that can organize, that after some reorganization can exist independently in the two hemispheres. Now, um, a really interesting question that people have not at all, th or only very few people have thought about, but I think could potentially be a very deep one, and it gets very close to, to what it means to be human, which is, is it possible that even in normals, that there are two or more forms of consciousness in our minds, that... Um, you know, if you, if you assume that there are different NCCs in different cortical hemispheres, or even within one cortical hemisphere, there could be different NCC in, you know, in the motor cortex from, you know, somatosensory, from vision, from olfactin, then to what extent can we, you know, we, we, we claim that we're unitary. It's a cherished notion of philosophers, particularly the unitary uh, nature of consciousness, although I don't see how you can uphold that in a split brain patient, because clearly you have one head now and two, exp two sets of different experiences. But it might be also possible that in normal people, people like you and me, there are two or more sort of conscious entities in our head. Now there's some, you know, in language sometimes we say the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. And um, you must have been in a situation where you've been conflicted, where you, I, I, I certainly have been, you know, when I, you know, run or when I, you know, swim and do another lap, that I have these two sort of voices inside my head. One says, you know, one tries to find excuses why I'm, I should stop now. The other one sort of eggs me on and urges me on to do more. I found a particular particularly interesting quote in this classic, the classic of the mountaineering literature. So he climbed in, the, in South uh, America and he, was, um, he fell off a precipice and was left dead for, by his friend because he couldn't find him. And then he, he, crawled, he literally crawled back for three days uh, by himself without water over a glacier to safety. And uh, he uses this term, I mean, he doesn't know anything about brain as far as I can tell. 
and he uses always the voice, uh, which really to me seemed like sort of, you know, the left hemisphere talking. And the, the while well, well, the right hemisphere sort of suggested nice, pleasant images of you know his wife and food and particular food and warmth because it was cold and he had no food and drink. So this was sort of the right down the, the, the this this one voice sort of well it wasn't a voice it was sort of more these vivid images of of food and his coming home and being warm and then the left one always urged him on. And it's an interesting question to what extent um, and you, if you observe yourself in the next couple of days you might find these. Um, I don't know how you call them, these um, weird things that sometimes you, you, you might actually, if you introspect yourself a little bit, you might actually find evidence of some sort of discontinuity in your mind that there might actually be normally operating sort of maybe, maybe sort of, you know, not one, really one whole mind, but maybe possible some evidence of two minds, two minds that very quickly get integrated, grace of the fact that you have these 200 million fibers, but under certain conditions you might find, it's possible that you might find that one hemisphere operates more independently uh, than another one. Which one do you think would be more dominant in this case? Well, I mean, the, the voice clearly seems to be this language one, right? And that's, like I said, that's certainly also by my, been my experience that that's, that sometimes when I have this inner dialogue going on, I have a clear voice, and then and then some, one other entity which seems to be much less verbal. And so, you know, one interpret. I mean, it's difficult. It's difficult really to judge that because, of course, you know. Maybe I'm reinterpreting all of this differently now that I know all this literature, but it seems to be that sometimes there's a more of a clearly verbal person inside my head and some other entity that seems to be more generate images. And that could easily be interpreted as the left brain versus the right brain. Um, and that, um, like I said, not, I mean, normally, now this is, I've seen several of these uh, descriptions. Usually I've seen them in the context of these severe uh, cases when you're probably under anoxia, you know, you don't have enough oxygen, I mean, under these severe cases when people describe this. So maybe under those conditions, you know, maybe because of restricted blood flow or whatever, there's less of a communication between the two hemispheres than, in a, than under normal conditions. But I think it's interesting as you go through your life to, to see whether you can observe this in your own, in your own experience. Most certainly. Most certainly. Yeah, I mean that transition. I mean, is controlled, of course, by these brainstem a widely di um, dispersed device, which I don't think anybody's ever shown there's an asymmetry there. But even if, even if you rouse the entire cortical hemisphere, may, maybe for whatever reason, one hemisphere goes quicker under, same thing when you go to sleep, right? Goes quicker under and arises more, more rapidly than the other one. It's entirely plausible. I mean, it's a bit difficult to test. Like I said, people do test uh, for asymmetric function in normals by putting images in, and then you find sort of these minor differences. You know, Looking your inner, into your inner train of thought is, of course, much more difficult because it has to be purely based on an introspective, and so it's much more open to interpretations. Um, I mean, of course, you know, some people. There's this um, one paper I'm currently reading, which argues strenuously that even under normal condition, there are more than um, there are more than two entities in in one's head. But our entire training throughout our entire life, our legal position, our you know position in the family and everywhere else is always based on the fact on what he calls this fiction that we are a single person, that there's a single person with a single set of memories, and that's who I am. I'm a, that's just how I think about it. And he's, this author argues that the, that might be, to a certain extent, illusionary, that under certain conditions there might be more than one voice, but we don't give reason to that voice. We don't give any chance for that voice, for these multiple voices to ever express themselves, because we're so much in thrall of this, of this uh, fiction of there being a single Christoph, but in fact there might be different Christophs inside my head. I just listen to them. <laughs> That's it. It's a very short lecture today. That's it.